Always a pleasure to have my next guest on, though, from an amazing organization that does a lot for this country and uh, just love everything that these guys do. And it's so important right now with workers' rights, uh, especially under this new administration. I think it's, we had kind of a four-year reprieve of, of having to worry about some of these uh, violations of workers' rights. And uh, this group is, is really good at this stuff. So I want to bring in right now my next guest. He is the president of the Right to Work Foundation. His name is Mark Mix. Mark, welcome back to the show. Don, good to be on with you. Can you hear me okay? Is our stuff working? It is working. Uh, yes, okay. I can hear you. So I'm, I'm, doing my, I'm doing my IT work myself today, so this is really exciting. <laughs> I, it's great. Absolutely. So I want to get into what, what's going on right now. And this has to do with the unions skimming money off of the, the Medicaid system. Um, it seems like we've been down this road before when it comes to home health care providers and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I remember certainly, and so don't my, my viewers, the uh, whole Janice case. And so I want to ask you a little bit about that, what the relationship might be to that. But first of all, can you just tell us exactly what's going on when it comes to union dues and, uh, and our Medicaid system? Yeah, this is a really interesting story, Don, because the there's actually the Janus case is important and relevant to this discussion, but there's a more important Supreme Court case that we won at the U.S. Supreme Court in 2014, a case called Harris v. Quinn that was specifically on the health care provider issue. And this case came out of Chicago, like the, like the Janus case did, came out of Illinois, actually, that they, uh, they violate individual rights there enough that we can bring these cases and they get up to the U.S. Supreme Court. But we were representing a, a lady by the name of Pam Harris, who was taking care of her developmentally disabled son, Joshua. Joshua was probably 27 or 28 years old now. But she, Joshua got a stipend from Medicare uh, to basically take care of Medicaid, excuse me, to take care of him. Uh, because instead of institutionalizing, it was less expensive for him to get a stipend to provide for his own care. He was able to you know, live at home and do things, but he needed care. And so his mom was his primary care provider. And so Joshua would get the Medicaid stipend, and that was used to cover the cost of taking care of Joshua. Well, it was interesting. The Service Employees International Union, when Rob Lagojevich was the governor out there back in, gosh, 2002, 2003, I think it was maybe, they decided that there was a pretty big pot of money here. And they went to Rob Lagojevich and said, look, you know, when this Medicaid money comes into the state, you ought to let us get in between that money and the recipient. And basically, Don, the statute says that's illegal. You can't do it. The, the statute that, that basically develops Medicaid and Medicare says the money has to go directly to the person as opposed to it can't go to a third party. And so when we ended up representing Pam, we went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court because the union had basically said we were going to get a cut of the money that was going to Pam <clears throat> and to Joshua. And the Supreme Court said, well, first of all, these people aren't really employed. They aren't government employees. So the fact that the state did this was a little bit problematic. And the fact that Blagojevich did an executive order and got a huge payoff by the SEIU for his next elections, mm -hmm. you know, that's nothing to see here. But then Governor Pat Quinn actually and the legislature passed a statute that said this process was perfectly legal. And that's what we went after in the U.S. Supreme Court. So after we won that case and when Trump was elected, we went back to the, the government, to the executive branch and said, hey, this rule, you ought to be able to firmly establish that no union can get in between the money and the person that's supposed to receive it. And there was some rulemaking done and some, some uh, regulations done at the executive level. And so during the Trump years, that due scheme was eliminated. Well, guess what? Now that the regime in Washington has is, is changed, they want to start this whole process back up so union officials can get in between you know, the Medicaid money and the person that's supposed to receive it. And, Don, it's a lot of money. And it, unions are going to use it to elect more politicians that, guess what, give them more power to force work, more workers into unions, that create more dues money that allows them to give more contributions to politicians. You know how the vicious cycle works. But that's what's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Mark, we talk about all these issues and it's always a follow the money thing. I mean, it's it's always so obvious and so blatant. So let me let me clear this up in my mind, because I, I listen to this and, I, and I'm thinking the Janus case. Right. I'm thinking this whole thing about forced unionization, all these kind of things. If they're getting a cut in a way that it is kind of a forced unionization. So tell me, how is this similar? But uh, tell me the differences between this and the, and the Janus case. Yeah, well, the Janus case, which we won in June of 2018, frees every government employee from the burden of being forced to pay fees to a union in order to work for their government. Now, that's a huge victory. That's a national right to work law, if you will, for all government employees across the country. The, the Medicaid scheme, 
case, the, the predicate of the Harris v. Quinn case that we won at the U.S. Supreme Court was that these providers weren't necessarily state employees. The union claimed them for purposes of accepting this money. That was basically all that they said. Yeah, you're employees to the extent that we can collect these fees through the Medicaid system, but we're not negotiating with you over vacation benefits and conditions of employment. And so it was kind of a unique kind of a, I don't know, a false uh, employment situation where the state created this, this falsehood so that they could regulate this and get the money to those workers. But here's what's going to happen. Some of these healthcare workers are indeed government employees. Uh, they will be going forward, I suspect, because mm-hmm. you know the healthcare system and part of the infrastructure bill is to is to give money to healthcare providers and basically say that they have to be neutral in union elections and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's a whole other story that goes to the budget reconciliation fight that's going on right now here in Washington, Don. But so the point is, if they're government employees, they can't be forced to pay fees to keep their jobs. But that's different than the union getting in between this flow of money that goes from the federal government to the states that provides Medicaid support for people that are qualified for it. So it's kind of a different set of circumstances where it's a different program and the unions are finding a way to get their little cut of the action. And that's what it's all about, to your point. You you say it perfectly well. Follow, think about following the money and you'll find basically what's happening and you'll find out you know how this works and how you need to how you need to operate to stop it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's always the case. So I, I want to get into this because we did have a chance to talk about this before, but I want to bring this up again because I think I haven't heard a lot of coverage on this. I don't hear a lot of people talking about this. And so I'm so thankful that your organization is is looking at this stuff and always watching this stuff. You guys have done more for right to work states as states. And and I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but I know it's over half of the states now. Thanks to you guys. Uh, are right to work, 27. Yeah. Right to work states. But something that was in the rescue bill, and I, and I remember talking about this again a few months back, something that was in the rescue plan, rescue bill that passed, had to do with kind of violating or taking away these rights of these states. So can you go into that a little bit for us? Because I think it is so important that people understand what's going on right now. Yeah, there's a lot going on when it comes to that, Don. And thanks for bringing it up again. But so you've got a couple of things going on right now. You've got legislation, the so-called PRO Act. This is the uh, allegedly, the, you know, they put these flower names on things. But they have nothing to do with what the bills actually do. They call this the Protecting the Right to Organize bill. <laughs> uh, this is a bill that's on. It passed the House of Representatives. It's on a no, no hearings, no testimony. No surprise mm-hmm. there, Don. Um, mm-hmm. But it got it's over in the Senate right now. And the first thing that well, that bill would do would be repeal all 27 right to work laws. And on, you know, the question, the obvious question is, well, how can the federal government repeal a state law that was passed by 27 states? But the answer is really, unfortunately, quite simple. The the, the power of the federal government is imposed from Washington on all of the states when it comes to private sector labor management relations. This was done back in the Roosevelt years, back in 1935. In fact, the last time we had a significant effort to pack the U.S. Supreme Court was over this issue of the federal government's control over private sector workers. Two chief, uh, the Chief Justice and another Associate Justice changed their votes, even though they ruled a similar bill unconstitutional just two years before. Roosevelt uh, put the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill in front of them, saying that they were going to add six additional justices to the Supreme Court, make it to go to 15. And as you know, Don, Article 3 doesn't say what, what size the Supreme Court should be. It just says there will be one. So the court's numbers have changed over time. But the last time it was seriously thought about packing it was when Roosevelt tried to get this federal imposed, you know, imposition on all the states for private sector labor management relations. And they did that and got it affirmed by the Supreme Court in 1937. And unions grew dramatically. And then in 1947, when the Republicans took over the House and the Senate, even though Truman was in the White House, the Congress said we went way too far. We gave union officials way too much power. They were using it to control major industries in the country, the coal industry, the steel industry. People were on strike all over the country. And so the Congress came in, and instead of, of course, repealing this federal impingement, infringement on states' rights, they decided to regulate it. One thing they did is they gave the states the right to pass right to work laws. There's a little section in the so-called TAP, well, not the so-called, but the Taft-Hartley Act, which is part of the National Labor Relations Act right now, that says if a state, by affirmative vote, can outlaw the closed shop, they can do it, and they can pass what are now known as a right to work law. 27 states have done that. But what the government gives, the government can take away. So what, what the element of the PRO Act is, and I need to say, I'll get into a little more about this, because the PRO Act is just not the only place where they're trying it, to your point, Don. Um, it would say, we're going to remove the privilege that a state has to pass these laws. And once they do that, if they eliminate that little small section of 14B, 
that all the right to work laws go away in this country and we go back under this federal imposition of forced unionism across the entire nation. Well, the PRO Act probably doesn't have a real fighting chance because they can't get, uh, well, I don't even know if they can get 50 votes, but they certainly can't get 60 votes to overcome what will be significant extended debate, otherwise known as the filibuster on a bill like this. I mean, that's no surprise. The Senate has these, you know, these, these rules set up that basically allow the passions of the legislature to cool a little bit before they do radical things like force everyone in America to pay union dues in order to get a keep a job. So what they're going to try to do is that they're trying to shoehorn it into the COVID relief bill. They tried that. They didn't get it done. They're trying to shoehorn it into the so-called infrastructure bill, that $1.2 trillion bill that ran into, a, ran into a little trouble on Thursday night in the House of Representatives. And they're also probably going to try to shoehorn it into the budget reconciliation bill, that $3.5 trillion monster, 5,000 pages um, that uh, they'll try to legislate on. Hopefully, the parliamentarian will hold up the regular order of the Senate saying that you can't legislate on an appropriation bill using what's called the Byrd Rule, which is a filter for any, quote, language in a budget reconciliation bill that is not budget-related or appropriation-related and is legislated. That stuff can't be done because the budget reconciliation bill can be passed with a simple majority. 50, 50 Democrats and Kamala Harris can pass a budget bill that adds, well, let me say, it, it doesn't add anything. It's all paid for. It doesn't cost anything, according to our president, <laughs> But that's kind of the strategy. And so they're trying every way possible to get the federal imposition of forced unionism across the entire nation once again. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't cost anything. We believe that, don't we? So I, I made a, <laughs> I made a debt ceiling then, Don. Why does the debt ceiling need to go up? It doesn't cost anything. Exactly. We should be able to lower it, maybe. <laughs> so I mentioned at the beginning that that things have changed. I mean, I think we had four years. So your organizations always has to be looking at this stuff. And I think we saw like a four year period where maybe things weren't as hectic. And now you guys got to be on your toes, Mark. So what other kind of things are you looking at right now that that you know they're going to go after or that you're maybe just concerned that eventually they're going to put this into some bill somewhere, too? Yeah, well, obviously, keeping track of the legislative stuff is really important. But the executive branch and the agency stuff is really where the action is gone. And we've got a big problem with the National Labor Relations Board. Just 23 minutes into this administration, Joe Biden fired the sitting general counsel of an independent agency, mm -hmm. the top lawyer of the National Labor Relations Board. He fired him 23 minutes. It never happened before. It's unprecedented. He had 11 or 10 and a half months left on his term. And every time there's been a transition of presidents, no one's tinkered with the top lawyer of these independent agencies. But Joe Biden and his union boss, Masters, knew that they had to get rid of this guy because there was a lot of things that happened over the last four years that did this down. Now, hold on to your seat. Put your seatbelt on because the National Labor Relations Board and that general counsel, Peter Robb, defined that the National Labor Relations Act had something to do with employee rights, not big business rights or privileges or not big labor union privileges or rights, but employee rights. And boy, oh boy, that set everything on fire because we can't have a third party in an equation between big business and big labor. It's just too, you know, it's too important. That, that relationship is too important. And the fight between those two, the clash is too important to include someone like maybe individual workers. But so what happened immediately upon the firing of the general counsel, the very next day, the acting general counsel who moved up got an email saying, you will resign by five o'clock or you will be fired. The acting general counsel said, you're not going to fire me. It's not good. You're making this look partisan. And this is an independent agency. I'll stay on my job. And of course, at five o'clock, she was fired. Immediately, they brought in a regional director from Chicago, and this person at, took over as acting general counsel. He put out a memo that immediately basically said they're going to look at five. They, had, they put out a memo about nine issues. Five of the issues they started talking about were issues that the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation had won over the last three and a half, four years on behalf of employees, not on behalf of workers or not on behalf of unions, not on, on behalf of big business but on behalf of employees exercising and expanding their rights in the American workplace. They had to stop that. They did. So he gets in, and then they finally got this Jennifer Abruzzo, the former top lawyer for the Communication Workers of America, big union, radical union. She now is the general counsel. She's put out two memos that talk specifically about the victories we won. And so we're just going to have to hold her accountable. We're going to keep our eye on everything this agency does for the next at least year and a half until maybe the House of Representatives can come in and kind of pull back some power through the appropriations process. We'll see. Big fight. 
Yeah, and and I'm so glad that you guys are involved in looking at this stuff because, uh, yeah, I think you guys are going to be really busy here over the next uh, three and a half years now anyway. But I know you also, you guys do a lot of things and this is this is about people helping you too. So you don't you're not just able to just do these things uh, nilly willy. You've got to have some support on that as well. So tell my listeners, my viewers, uh, tell them a little bit more about how they can get involved, how they can help you guys out, Mark. Sure, Don. And and by the way, this next couple of years are going to be going to be good for you too. You're going to have a lot of things to talk about. So congratulations <laughs> yes. to you. Thanks. But yeah, no, you know the National Right to Work Committee, National Right to Work Foundation survive on voluntary contributions. We don't receive any government money. No government grants wouldn't accept it if they offered it. We just wouldn't do that. We survive on the disposable nature of disposable income for folks that believe in freedom and liberty. And Don, about a third of our membership base are either retired or current union members who believe that they should have the freedom to choose in the American workplace. Another third are, are small business people who are running businesses and employing people. And then the final third are kind of philosophical donors, conservative donors who are involved in the public policy process and support us. And that's how we survive. And you know, in any given 12-month rolling period, we have about 100,000 donors. And the average contribution is about $75. And so we keep going. We have 21 staff attorneys at the foundation that do nothing but represent employees. They provide this legal service for free. But we very rarely get any legal fees back because the cases we take aren't generally fee shifting cases. So we survive on voluntary contributions. And by and Don, I appreciate you allowing us to talk about the work that we do at the foundation and encouraging and informing more people about our work. But yeah, it's all voluntary contributions. And, and uh, I don't want compulsion. I don't want force, although I know it'd be kind of neat if government said everyone had to support us to, you know, whatever. <laughs> you're, you're on the wrong side of the aisles right now, my friend. So are I. <laughs> so NRT, NRTW.org is where you can go to find out more about this great organization, National Right to Work Foundation President Mark Mix. Always great to have you on, Mark, and I look forward to having you back on again soon. Fantastic, John. Thanks for the opportunity and keep up the good work yourself, okay? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Mark Mix, everybody.